us. So I am legally obligated to remind you, as the voice said, we are now recording. So <laughs> I will reshare the screen. OK, so kind of my hope for us today and kind of uh, where we will start is one place that's always a quick uh, place to start these sort of conversations. And many of us here uh, live in places, and pretty much everyone in the United States of America live in places that was first inhabited uh, by folks, uh, by Native American uh, people and first peoples. Uh, so one place to, um, to, to kind of start is always giving a land acknowledgement. So I live in Calumet, Michigan, and that is part of the Ashinaabwe culture uh, that has been proliferated throughout the entire part of the UP, uh, and especially some of our um, our, our neighbors that we have, our siblings, uh, native siblings, especially up here, the ancestors of the Keweenaw Bay Indian community. Uh, if that's something that you like to uh, think about and talk about, uh, or just to investigate more, you can go to this website, which is called uh, nativeland.ca. It'll bring up a map of the United States and you can type in your current address or an address you used to live and see uh, what first peoples lived in those places and get more information uh, about those uh, those tribal siblings that have lived and do currently live in your area. So that's one of the first things um, that I want to share, because that's what I hope for us to do today uh, to help define a couple of uh, the polarizing terms that we have that we have uh, both that have breached politically and also uh, in some of our congregations, not always necessarily in our congregations here, but I hope that with conversations and uh, discussions like these, they can. Um, so I hope to find a couple of those, help to create some questions in you uh, that will spur future conversations and explorations amongst you and the people you do life with. Uh, and then finally, because of these conversations, live into our shared baptismal call for peace and justice in the world. Um, when any of our siblings uh, hurt, we hurt too, because it's that shared peace of the Holy Spirit that all of us have um, together. But I also like to say this, I am not an expert on racial uh, justice, racial issues, white privilege and these things, I learn right alongside every one of you. Um, uh, for some of us, this might be our first time that we're delving into some of these issues, which is why some of these things will kind of be on the surface, but others have dug a little deeper. Um, so possibly things that you hear um, might spur a, a, a training that you've had before or might spur an idea that you have for us uh, today. So uh, I hope that happens, but uh, like I said, I am not an expert, um, but uh, I love to have these conversations because they're important for all of us to have. But if we had more time or we're having longer sessions, one of the first things we would do would be uh, to establish our group covenant. And since we don't have that time together to do, I kind of uh, wanted to throw up some things that I think we can agree to as this group uh, together, since sometimes these issues do kind of um, dig in a little bit at times. Uh, so our hope is, or my hope is, that everyone's story as they talk is heard and respected. All of us come from different backgrounds, different ways of understanding, and have different places um, that these, these issues can kind of uh, rub against inside all of us. So I hope that we respect and hear uh, where people are coming from. Things shared in confidence are held in confidence. We are recording, uh, there, so there might be a time when people might view this again. Um, but uh, the hope is that as people hear, as people share, these aren't words or terms or things that be used against us that we would be able to, to embrace uh, our learning and our confusion or questions together. Um, and also the big one, people take responsibility for their own learning. I can't force you to believe anything. I can't make you understand in a different way. That is up to us individually to move forward. And it is okay to disagree. We might leave this meeting not agreeing on anything that we talked about, but at least in faith, we sat, listened, and talked together. Uh, and then it is not okay to shame, blame, or attack. Uh, even if we say the wrong thing, like I do often in these types of conversations, um, we don't want to shame others who say these things. We want to look at them in love and keep our Lutheran understanding of grace uh, out there. But also when people do say things that might be offensive, uh, we'd like to bring it to light, but not in a way that makes them feel um, less than in any way. So that is my hope there. Uh, it's always good to start with a little bit of a story. So I wanna talk about how I got here um, so, uh, and how I became involved in justice work. So I am uh, originally from North Central Ohio. Uh, and when I was in seminary and even before, I worked on issues of uh, eco justice, uh, talking about uh, clean air, 
clean water, places where you can grow vegetables and all those things in, a, in easy ways and honor those places. But as I started do, digging deeper into that work, uh, I joined a, an organization called Ohio Interfaith Power and Light and served on their board, which is an organization that is interfaith, uh, that looks at how people of faith can encounter these uh, pieces of eco justice and eco spirituality together in a bigger way. Uh, and then I would go to the state house and I would start um, talking to legislators about uh, how these pieces of legislation might uh, affect um, affect our land, affect the way that we grow things, affect the way that the beauty of this earth is continued. But I would meet people. I would meet people who were from urban areas, bigger cities. And instead of fighting for just clean air, clean water, and a clean place to grow your vegetables, they were fighting just to get a vegetable, to get a meal that wasn't packaged in a box. And that led me to start uh, understanding more deeply about how uh, policies that were put in place have kind of uh, had some folks who live in the suburbs have better access to these things than our folks who might live in urban centers, which traditionally have been folks uh, of color. And I never thought I would be living here in the Northern Great Lakes Synod uh, in the UP, uh, but God called me up here and I never thought I'd be sitting here leading a discussion on uh, white privilege and social justice. But God leads us in these ways that uh, sometimes can make our insides uh, tingle a little bit, but we are called to breathe through and move forward with them. And so here I am, and here we are together. So I thank you for being part uh, of this conversation. So um, I first want to start with uh, the idea of bias. And some of us have talked about bias before. And bias can be as simple as uh, how you view certain things. Uh, like when I was a kid, I was biased to wanting pizza and not broccoli. That's kind of the first things that kind of start of choosing one thing over another. Uh, but there's two places uh, where we talk about bias, one being implicit and explicit. So implicit is the one that we do that is unconscious. It's an unconscious attitude or stereotype uh, or action, both positive and negative, towards members of a group uh, merely because of their membership in that group, which in our racial justice talks is usually um, the unconscious attitudes that we have usually as uh, a certain uh, class of people or white uh, suburban between sometimes our traditionally black and urban neighbors or uh, with our native, our native siblings who live nearby us now. Um, and explicit is when we do these things on purpose. So where I live, we have uh, biases that happen all the time between different religious communities. We have different uh, Lutheran communities here that don't interact in a very uh, always substantial and healthy way, bias towards one or the other, or where uh, I am, we have the village of Lorium, where I live, which is more residential, and the historical village of Calumet. And there's always tension between who lives where and how those things happen. So um, that's kind of those uh, things. But the one thing we keep in mind is we only see that which we are trained to see, reminding us that some of these unconscious ways that we express ourselves, or the unconscious ways that we uh, live into these ideas together are all learned. And so the hope is that they can be unlearned as we talk about them and expose them together. So we're gonna do a quick uh, activity and a poll to kind of do this um, together. Since we're smaller, we'll start here. And that is, if I were to show you my history and what biases you might have, you would look at me. This is my ethnic uh, DNA for myself, Eastern uh, England and Northern Europe, Wales, Scotland, Norway, and Ireland, and there's a picture. So what, from looking at those facts and looking at my feet in the water, I invite someone to unmute themselves. What do you think about this person who's in this photograph or picture? If you had to judge me. I know I'm putting myself on that too, but if someone would like to unmute and just say, from looking at this, this makes me think this. It reminds me of myself. Okay. That's one thing. I grew up here and um, I'm a quarter Finn and a quarter Swede. And anyway, we, we had those percentages all, the, all my life and everybody yeah. knew immediately what percent they were. So um, eight percent Norwegian. It's you know gl glad you got some in there. That's right. 
And that's kind of where some of our biases here in our area start between how much Scandinavian you have and how that can represent who you can do life with and how you eat a pasty and how you do things as that part of your DNA that's expressed forward. So we're gonna do a poll that kind of helps us too to kind of live into these biases uh, as well. And I'm gonna launch a poll. It'll come up on your screen. There's only five questions. Uh, and so we'll do that quickly together. I can kind of see those answers as they come. If you're not on a screen, you might not be able to do this, but uh, this is really quick, really quick poll to get us thinking about bias together. This is always good on camera because everyone leans in and I see everybody's squinty intense face, so. Stop my screen share really quick. Take about another 30 seconds to kind of get in uh, and finish this poll for folks who can see it. Okay. So even if you didn't have a chance to look through all these, almost everybody has, I'm gonna go ahead and end it real quick. And then I will share the results with us uh, so you can see the results uh, on your screen as well. So we're gonna work through these really quick uh, to kind of show and uh, our biases um, um, together to see if we have seen them and experienced them in our own lives. So first question was about job applicants, similar in every detail, except one was male and one was female. Uh, everyone keyed in on this one. It's a bias that we talk about and we learn about all the time that John, the man was more uh, likely to be hired uh, with a starting salary um, of what it was because we have lived into this idea that oftentimes men and continue to make more money um, than women, that pay gap that we have. Uh, right now, that pay gap is on average of 93 cents on the dollar, which means it's improving, but it's still not um, where it is. And in many places, the skew is bigger. Um, so that is one bias that many hiring managers have between male and female before we even talk about race. The second one was, in America, only 14% of men are estimated to have this attribute. However, 60% of CEOs in the Fortune 500 companies have it. And that is unfortunately not a college degree. It's a standing of height over six feet tall. For some reason, boards look at uh, people and they want to have these taller, I guess, more masculine men, me being a five, seven person. I don't understand that at all. Maybe there's a better air as you pass six feet that I can't access, or maybe the sun shines a little bit brighter in some way. Um, but uh, for some reason, and that is a bias that people have had to run your company, you need these big, taller people. Uh, number three was everybody has unconscious bias. Absolutely, we do. Everybody does, whether we know it or not. And it's not always bad. Just because we have a bias for one thing or another, does not mean it is bad. It, it only uh, gets bad when it starts to hurt those around us. And uh, sometimes um, our biases don't uh, get to that level. Uh, number four, uh, we can only have an unconscious bias between people who are different from us. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> that is false. We can have a bias against people who belong to our same group all the time. Uh, even people in our, in our own uh, families, we can have bias towards people of our own gender, we can have biases for. Um, and it's not uncommon to have these biases, they happen all the time. And finally, to see uh, our last one is the people in my family are the smartest people I know. Interestingly, everybody put false, 
But oftentimes there's association bias that if it's between a family member and another, um, we either choose what is familiar to us, like our family, although no one in our families we would choose, but uh, there's always that familiarity bias that sometimes those that I know best will do the best. And sometimes that is good, sometimes that is bad, but that's kind of where these, these things uh, begin and start. So I thank you for doing that a, a little bit um, to kind of unlock a little bit of stuff about bias, but uh, I always like to remind us that uh, it is not necessarily a bad thing to have these biases. And I'm gonna pop in my screen up again here as we continue forward. Uh, if this interests you in any way to learn more about how these biases are represented or how these biases move forward, um, there is a place you can go and I'm gonna put the website in for you. Uh, Harvard University does uh, implicit bias tests all the time. Um, and that's what these, uh, this little thing I will do for you right now, put it in the chat. So these tests uh, are usually with pictures and or words, and they try to help you associate a picture with a word, and then they flop it around to see which way your bias goes on looking at a picture or something. So for example, uh, sometimes these quizzes start out with a, a light-skinned person and good and a black uh, or brown-skinned person being bad, and you have to go through and do these little word selections as quick as possible. And as they swap them over, sometimes the speed they ask you in which to fill out these questions um, make it to a point where you can kind of see your biases play out in real time. Not to shame anybody, but to let us be aware that these parts are in ourselves as we move forward um, in these things. So that's a little bit about that bias. So now we move into a little bit of privilege. Um, so privilege in general is just a special right or advantage or immunity granted or available only to a particular person or group. Often we talk about it in when we talk about uh, racism as white privilege, just the fact that my skin looks the way that it does is uh, how uh, I get special privileges known and unknown uh, in the things that I do. This one's a lot more difficult for us to see sometimes because it's not always evident up front, uh, especially in our neighborhoods where diversity skews between how much or what kind of Scandinavian you are. Uh, it's hard to always see, but who you are, who you do life with, uh, who you have learned from kind of helps to understand uh, these pieces. And it's difficult to encounter privilege in places that are often more predominantly white. And it's hard to understand uh, how it expresses itself um, out in other ways. Uh, but sometimes when we go places, we get exposed more uh, to these pieces. And so I have a short uh, video clip that kind of expressed to us ways that these uh, privilege conversation and biases come up when we first realize them. So this is a video of a woman by the name of Sue Borgio, who was a chancellor of the University of Michigan at Flint, who had a different and a difficult life story to get where she was, but uh, an interesting way that she encountered privilege um, in one of her classes. So we'll show that. I was a college sophomore the first time I heard about privilege, and it didn't go so well. I was humiliated. I was in a class where a faculty member was talking about black urban families, and she described characteristics like headed by women, uh, high unemployment rate, underemployment rates, uh, high rates of teenage pregnancy. I don't remember all the characteristics today. What I remember was feeling strangely familiar and confused. How could she be describing the, the characteristics of black urban families and me feeling like they applied to my family. I didn't quite know how to ask a question. I was a first generation college student and I was really nervous, but I raised my hand and took a breath and I said to her, uh, are there some things that are about urban and not black? Because I'm trying to figure out how it is that what you're describing fits my white family. She eyeballed me for a minute and she pointed at me and said, don't you ever compare yourself to a black family. It doesn't matter how poor you are or how underemployed you are. You have privilege because you're white. Well, I was horrified. I could feel my face flush and I looked down at my book just staring straight ahead. Someplace between, can I crawl under the desk here or do I just hit her and leave? <laughs> 
you want to talk about poor? <laughs> so I breathed and I sat there for a moment and I was really confused. I wasn't, I, I had no idea what that was about. I had no idea that day of what Peggy McIntosh calls the invisible package of unearned benefits, white privilege. The invisible package of unearned benefits. Now, I was an emancipated minor at 15. I didn't have health insurance. I didn't have dental insurance. If I had to go to the dentist, I had to work out a $25 a month gig in order to get a tooth fixed. In fact, at that point in my life, I didn't have a home address or a home, and I was worried when school ended, and I had to clean out my dorm room what I would do with my things because colleges didn't let you keep your stuff there all summer. They rented those rooms out. And she said I was privileged. I mean, who, what the, I couldn't get my hands around any of that at that moment in time. But come back to the invisible, unearned, Ben package of benefits. At some level, the professor was right. I couldn't get my hands around it at that point. I wouldn't live into that for a long time. And this is the place where the conversation for people who look like me and with people who look like me can get a little difficult. We have to be able to breathe through our defensiveness about the fact that that's not talking about me. That's not talking about me, but I promise you, if we can do this and unpack that privilege, we can make more space for a more humane and just world. So she goes on for a little bit longer about um, this. It's a, it's a TED talk that she did, um, but it actually is a very interesting TED talk as she unpacks that for, for us and for her. Um, what I'm going to do is they're going to try to split us into a little bit smaller little groups to talk for a second, um, because when you first have these discussions of white privilege, they can some, they can be very difficult. Um, when I had my first big group discussion, uh, similar to kind of how we're kind of skimming the surface, uh, I was in seminary with a huge group of uh, my fellow seminarians. Uh, not all of us were uh, candidates to go into ministry, but there were some music candidates and other things. Um, that was one of the most contentious things I've ever sat through. Um, because some of us have a hard time, one, seeing the privilege that we have because we are white by the color of our skin, and two, uh, because sometimes we feel attacked in these uh, conversations and discussions. Um, so I wanted to break us into a little bit of group for once to uh, you can kind of talk uh, for a minute or two about the video, but also ask, answer the question together. Have you ever been in a situation um, where the, you felt singled out or not because of how you looked? doesn't necessarily have to be the color of your skin, but from how you looked. And I know introverts are now squirming, but uh, I apologize for that. But hopefully the smaller group aspect uh, helps. But I will tell you, last time my breakout rooms didn't work. So there's still a chance that it won't work today. So uh, I'm going to do that. We're probably about three, uh, probably four minutes to kind of talk about uh, if you've experienced this in any way, it actually worked today. So we'll see how that goes. So I'm gonna create those real quick. Um, so the question is, have you ever experienced uh, uh, these kind of where you've singled out by from how you look uh, or any way or any reactions you have to her video? So we'll do that now.
Do it. Well, welcome back uh, to everyone who popped into those rooms. Um, again, you don't always know if they're going to go well or not, but does anyone like to share anything out of anything that you heard or anything that you said from uh, those groups for any extra extroverts? <laughs> you don't have to if you don't have anything. But. <laughs> <clears throat> but as we said, sometimes these, uh, it's, it's always hard to see. And that's one of the things that she talked about um, when she talks about white privilege was the um, invisible package of benefits that we have. Um, she said also, uh, she referenced a piece that I'm going to put into the chat as well. She referenced um, a Barbara McIntosh uh, article that was written in 1989, and it's called The uh, Invisible knapsack or white privilege unpacking the invisible knapsack and that is what this thing is and i want to tell talk a couple of these um things how we can start to see uh white privilege even if it's hard to understand where it is and how it manifests itself and um and that is the article there but this article goes through 26 uh ideas that kind of help demonstrate uh, how white privilege has shown itself in our world uh, i have a couple of the highlights uh here um, ask yourself, if I wish to arrange to be in the company of people, uh, in the company of any people, um, it would be of my race most of the time. So I can easily make a, a dinner plan, a desert res res reservation with people who look like me most of the time. Another one is I can turn on the television or open the front page of the newspaper and see people of my race widely represented. Now, there are a lot of programs that are making some great strides in showing uh, different than just white characters are the main characters and people of color are usually the secondary characters. Some of those shows are like Abbott Elementary, or if you've uh, watched Reservation Dogs, some of those are bringing more uh, people of diversity to the forefront of these programs, which is good. But especially in 1989, as she's writing this, that was not happening. And it's probably, in my mind, not happening enough. And then finally, when I'm told about our national heritage or about civilization, I'm shown people of my color made it what it is. Uh, especially up here, we talk in, in grand terms about the Scandinavian immigrants and other people from Europe who came over and made these communities what they are, forgetting about they were already beautiful communities before that happened. Um, so how do our people, our, our, our siblings, our native siblings feel when culture is only pertained to when the white settlers came in and took over the land. Not necessarily a good conversation. And I'm not trying to make a judgment call on that, but if Calumet, where I live, only became Calumet because of those mines and those miners were missing so much about what this place has beyond those pieces of history. Um, so that's that piece that I shared with you. You can look a little deeper into that. Um, but finally, I wanted to end here because this is where it's become such a political uh, football is to talk about race in our schools. If you have paid attention, especially in these last couple of races uh, that have been political, uh, not talking about the uh, election fights that are happening, but talking about what is being taught in schools. There's been so many fights happening on the school board levels where school board members have just been beaten up because of what uh, they perceive uh, is being taught in schools or not. So I wanted to take a second to talk about this. And this is what is being, and there's even an article in um, the, the Christian Century, if you're a Christian Century reader, that Peter Marty wrote about this. And it's being called, um, well, I want to start here. I missed a piece. So when I was in school, I, I was trying to reflect on myself what happened when I was taught. Uh, I was a history major in college. And if I wasn't going to be a pastor, that's probably where I would have landed. Um, knowing that the world doesn't need another white balding history teacher, but yet that's where I was headed. But as I reflected back on how, what I learned in school, I remember vividly this picture um, that I'm sharing with you right now, the picture of uh, Africans packed into a ship and, and the slave ship and brought over. I remember that had a huge impact on me to understand something different about the place in which I lived. And I know that my teachers weren't telling me the whole truth, but this picture, this picture felt different. This picture made me think differently about uh, the country. This picture made me feel differently about uh, people um, that I did life with because in my school, we were predominantly white. And so this was a different way for me to think. 
Um, as I moved on, I learned more stuff about uh, the history of the United States, how it came to be, and all these issues um, based in race and how they manifested themselves. Um, and I don't think that that, um, in my mind, things were kept from me, but that is where we're going right now, is to talk about these uncomfortable pictures, these uncomfortable pieces of our history, and framing them in interesting, sometimes different, and in sometimes, I think, inconsistent ways. Uh, the article I was talking about in the Christian century is talking about this legislating discomfort. When people hear about these issues, it makes us feel uncomfortable. And so now there are many places that are trying to legislate these things. Uh, the picture you have in front of you is um, of the United States. Again, the UP is missing, but these are just boxes, so I was okay with it. Um, but there are 36 states uh, currently restricting education on racism bias uh, in the contributions of specific racial or ethnic groups in U.S. history. Uh, I'm going to pull out two of those states, Michigan and Wisconsin, just to kind of see uh, what those two bills are. But these states are looking at these ideas of race and kind of wanting to make sure that our students don't hear the parts that make us uncomfortable when we talk about the history of America. Um, those two things in Michigan, it's SB 460, uh, they talk about restricting teaching on the 1619 project, which we'll have a chance to briefly talk about that as we're closing up. Um, it was introduced in 2021. It prohibits school lessons promoting the 1619 project or any content deemed anti-American or racist. Uh, SB 411 in Wisconsin, teachers must post a curriculum. Uh, in January 2022, the Wisconsin passed this bill largely on partisan lines uh, about institutional structural racism. Uh, the myth of mediocrity and white privilege in Wisconsin public schools. Um, they, they do make a, a, a comment there about the political piece, um, but that's what these pieces are being legislated, not wanting to teach race in certain ways in our schools. And I want us to remember those things we talked about before is uh, we can disagree or agree with where these things are going, but we still, they are part of what's going on in and outside of our culture. But oftentimes, um, and they're talking about the 1619 project. They also talk about critical race theory. So I wanna take the small remaining minutes to see how these things are manifesting themselves and talk a little bit about critical race theory and then briefly about the 1619 project. Um, many of us have heard about critical race theory and I'm gonna show a video of someone who helps explain it in a little bit deeper terms and to kind of help us understand where it is, uh, where it's going and maybe a little bit about what it's not. This will be a brief video for us. Time is going a little bit better than last time, so that's good. Let's just start with a basic definitional question. When you hear critical race theory over and over again, what should people understand? How do you define CRT? So I first want to just make a distinction between CRT, which is a theoretical framework that I learned in graduate school uh, or in read about in graduate school versus teaching about race and racism in American history critically. So critical race theory is a framework. It's a theoretical framework that was developed in the 1980s by legal scholars to help us understand um, how it is that structural and racial disparities endure in our society and how that is actually engendered in some of our laws and policies. And so the idea was to get us to think uh, systemically as opposed to just thinking that ra racism manifests um, by individuals just mistreating each other, that there are actual structures in our society that create these different kinds of racial gaps and racial disparities economically um, in terms of housing, in terms of education. And so that's what they do, is that they actually show us how the law, um, how laws that are supposed to be mutual, uh, 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 neutral actually can promulgate or support racial disparities. That's a theoretical framework. I think what we're talking about today, though, is some contestation and conflict over how you teach about race, racial hierarchies, um, critically, racism in schools and society. And so the two are being conflated. Another question coming to us from a YouTube viewer. This is from Bryson Constable, more on critical race theory. You see, I told you people would have questions. I knew it's the kind of thing that everyone just, you hear about all the time, but you really don't quite understand what it all means. Bryson, thank you for your question. Here it is. Is critical race theory aimed at achieving a scenario where race no longer becomes an issue? Or is it more aimed at elevating the importance of race? In other words, what's the end goal for CRT? The end goal for CRT is to get rid of racism. 
race will never be uh, gone because if because we've been racial classified. It's a social construction that's imposed on our bodies. I don't know if practically we'll ever get rid of race because we use these markers to define and differentiate ourselves biological, uh, by, uh, in term, phen uh, phenotypically, and, um, but not bio race is not biology. biology. Critical race theory is about racism, okay? So racism is a system of forces that come to work together to create these massive disparities in our society. We got wealth, economic, political, housing, homelessness, um, the, the criminal justice system as we talk about, incarceration rates. Why are they so disparate and why are they so racialized? Why are they so disproportionately and adversely affecting people who are African American and indigenous? And, um, and so that's the question. Critical race theory doesn't want that to be the case. So that's a really brief uh, introduction into kind of these things is that we there's been a use of critical race theory as a buzz term to kind of uh, tear down any talk about racism itself. But uh, critical race theory itself is just a theory and a legal framework theory developed in the seventies and like she says, the eighties. And it's an academic framework, similar to how the constitution is kind of our groundwork and then laws and things make that. Uh, she's talking about it in the same way, but there are laws that come together that has kind of framed how people have lived um, throughout this whole uh, founding uh, of America. So it, it recognizes that racism can be systematic. And I will say, this is the only time that we try to get more political on that. We had to change our fundamental constitution to make room for women and people of race to more highly participate in voting and being part of, uh, of how we make laws and pass laws. And uh, I would say that those things are ringing true in a lot of the debates that we're having right now, especially in the election debates. We had to change our constitution to make room for those, uh, for, for people of, of color, for, for women to be part of that. When you have to change something to make room, then something has a fundamental undercurrent that needs to be fixed. And uh, that's kind of what critical race theory is encountering. It's not trying to say that everything we've done is wrong, but let's look at other ways to view it as we move through it. And so finally, um, one of those projects that has come out of that is the 1619 project, which is very recent, which is very recent. It only really started coming out um, in 2019. It's now a book. Uh, it was published in 2020. It's called the 1619 Project. It asks this question of how slavery shaped American political, social, and economic institutions. It's named the 1619 Project because that is when the first African slaves came to the United States. And there is a belief um, that in that, uh, as America grew, we were able to have a, a really solid economic underpinning because we had free labor in the United States. Um, that free labor helped cause the economic catalyst that moved America forward, leading to the Declaration of Independence and leading to uh, America as it is. And so that's kind of what that argument is pushing towards. Uh, I have a link uh, about this uh, specifically, uh, the critical race theory um, or the 1619 project and all these things uh, in this document, which I will sh share with you. Um, this document that I'm sharing is has all the resources that I use today and a couple other ones. And some of the final resources are is a the New York Times magazine and also a little bit of how people are critically engaging with these things. I will say not all historians, not all people believe that critical race theory uh, should be used. But there is, we're trying to have a, a dialogue about what it might mean if we're more open to how these ideas of a system of government might be playing uh, and might be pushing rape people, our siblings, our black and brown siblings, our native siblings, uh, into a place that they don't feel that they can uh, advance until the system itself changes. Um, so that is basically uh, all I have. I did share that with you. I wanna share my email with you because I would love to continue the conversation. And if there are questions, that is why we basically got in under the wire. And I'm like last time there was no time for any, any talk. So I did it a little bit better this time, Lori. But uh, if you have any questions or wanna talk to me further about any of these things, I would love to. Uh, I, again, I don't know all the answers, but I love to have questions. I love to talk through these issues. Uh, because I try to understand just like you all try to understand on how these things uh, impact our lives, and especially as people of faith. Um, the Holy Spirit binds us together, and uh, the Holy Spirit helps us learn in. And as a church in the ELCA, we are 90 plus percent white. 
And so for some reason, what we are doing um, is not open and engaging and authentic to people of color. And so we have to have these discussions to figure out where our blind spots are uh, to welcome those people of faith instead of asking them to conform to us. Uh, we've got to find ways that we embrace their spirituality, uh, especially our Native American siblings. Uh, the expression of, um, of worship, if anyone's ever uh, talked with or worshiped with our sister synod in Tanzania, it's a different expression of how God uh, lives in to the world that sometimes our predominant white churches don't have. So that's basically where I am. If there's any questions or anything like that, um, I would love um, those to happen now. <laughs> or just talk in general. Pastor like Jerry? This, yes. Now that, I'm stop my screen share. Now, now that this has been um, recorded, will the chat... Yep be available and i'm asking because can we go there and and access those links that's just my own ignorance about how zoom works i'm not sure that uh it, that, that that part will be but i can save uh, the chat separately if not i mean i anyone can um grab it right now uh grab that link and paste it into a, a site or just have it open on your computer and they and yeah. they also can. It's not hard to to find you on the internet. No. We want to contact you and and say, could you yeah. please send that link? Yeah. Uh, and also at the bottom of that link, uh, the the our synod website has a whole plethora of resources yeah. to help you get started. If you want to have like uh, Bible studies or you want to have book uh, book studies, there's a whole list of some of these books that you can start with. Uh, to open up these discussions and these doors in, in a non-combative uh, way of just sitting down together with cups of coffee and talking about these issues of race. Um, and even the, the group that spun off of the um, racial equity challenge, uh, there's also some more resources that I have there. Uh, I would love to uh, help your groups talk about racism in deeper ways. I think it's important for us to do, yeah. I was Pastor Jared, I was going to ask you that question in congregation, like how yeah. is this button started? Because I so agree, this is such a learning journey, right? So whether it's keeping a little privileged journal for yourself as you notice things yeah. or other things. Um, so there are book clubs, there are other things, but it, it just seems that we have an inertia to getting started. Do you have any tips yeah. for how for you in your congregation or other places? I confess that my congregation, even though I have lived into this stuff, we don't talk very much about race. It's not always an easy conversation. I've invite people to these conversations and it's hard to start. Um, mm -hmm. Usually you get one or two things happen when you invite people to these conversations. One is uh, people are happy to engage because it's, they also feel the same way. And so finding a book um, like How to Be an Anti-Racist, which is a book that a lot of people have started with that kind of has yep. these techniques. Uh, that's in that list. Um, uh, to, to kind of just talk through folks who kind of feel the same way, but then also you've got to figure out ways to invite people who definitely don't feel the same way. And for some yeah. reason, this is the biggest change that I think we all need to figure out for our churches is churches used to be a place where diametrically opposed people could sit down and have a conversation and laugh through it. And somewhere on the, the public square or the political dialogue has caused that we can't do that. The, the corner coffee shop conversations aren't happening with diversity anymore in terms of how people, the, the Republican or Democrat, aren't able to talk anymore. So how do we have these, you have to start with how these places, how do we communicate with each other? And then maybe these conversations can blend in. Um, there's a, another movie, uh, it's called about being purple that we have, that we watch that also talks about how do you open these conversations um, where people who believe differently can have their story told and listen to and how do you respond to those things uh that movie we did as a group too and it was great to see how folks diametrically opposed actually have a lot of middle ground where they agree with mm -hmm. but the vitriol of how we talk about 1619 or how we talk about critical race theory as soon as those words happen bam i'm triggered and i can't talk anymore so let's try mm -hmm. to find those space where everyone feels comfortable sorry i talked too much no no that's really that's helpful i made lots of mistakes um <laughs> Get, um, help uh, trying to get congreg my congregations to talk about racism. One thing yeah. that did help was when we needed to replace our nativity scene. And I asked if we could try and find one that was um, racially correct, historically correct. Absolutely. And, and do you know, we couldn't find one. Oh. because We had a, a big one, but we, but that was, that became 
an educational piece. And um, so mm -hmm. even something like that, that just kind of, I made yeah. lots and lots of mistakes, but that was, that was one that opened the door a little bit. Yeah. I invite um, you to walk around your church and look at your pictures. I'm in a room right now that has three white Jesus staring at me. I mean, so, I mean, that's not who Jesus was culturally. There's no way that that's Jesus. Walk around your church. Look at the images that you portray for Jesus. Uh, we have a big painting in the back of our sanctuary that we're not going to change. That's white Jesus. And that, <laughs> that's gonna, if we ever did want to do that, that's one of the first openings because Jesus yes. culturally would not be a white person, but yet we represent him as um, European. Thankfully, these aren't blonde haired, blue eyed Jesuses. They're trying a little bit, but still, it's not who Jesus was. <laughs> <laughs> as he stares at me i'm sorry yes. jesus so yeah sometimes those walks even walking around your neighborhood um and start seeing the disparity even amongst the people you do life with opens up these ideas of bias and those type of things just to kind of understand where people are coming from so i think that's what's been lost more than anything else is that we don't understand or want to understand the plight of somebody else because we've become so focused on how hard it is for our churches to grow that we forget that we're leaving behind our communities too and not thinking about how we can help repair the damage that our communities have done to each other, um, especially during COVID. Um, it's been so easy to just throw bombs at people and call them names and label them rather than sitting down at that coffee shop and having a conversation. Um, and I admit, I don't do a good job of that either. That's why I, I do think God pushes and pulls us to do these things. And hopefully we can. So, and that's why I thank you for doing it too. Even this small little bit, hopefully opened up a piece of the Holy Spirit in you to have these conversations. There is a book group that grew out of um, a class on um, bias and, and racism yes. in rural America. And if anyone wants me I can connect you with that. Send me an email if you'd like to connect with them. I'm not sure that um, racism and bias is still the theme of that book, but um, Pastor Jared um, just volunteered to do something on an ongoing basis, yeah. and um, we'll explore possibilities, you know, that there's yeah. clearly interest in this synod, and um, I am most pleased and proud that people are hungry to listen and to learn. And, and we had tremendous response to um, courses on Anishinaabe culture in the past year. So this will yeah. keep going. And uh, just as we close to, I, I, I said it in the last one, I forgot about this one. Like our, our uh, Doctrine of Discovery group has opened mm -hmm. up some doors for us. There will, there, there will be more invitations for us to go and do things with our Native American siblings. I encourage you to do that. Those are entry points that all of us can find because they are so close to us and uh, they are eager for us to hear from them, not for us to go talk to them, but to hear how their, uh, their, their tribal groups or how they express uh, their love for the creator. They're eager to tell us about that because too often we go and tell them about our God, quote unquote, and not respect what they also have because it's the same creator that creates. So that's an easy place to start. And that's noon. So I don't know if there's anything else. Like I said, there's my email. And uh, obviously, Dick and Lori knows how to get in touch with me. Some of you can uh, send me hate email to Faith Lutheran Church and Cal just kidding, and Calumet, whatever <laughs> you want to do. But, uh, but absolutely, I would love to have more conversations. Um, Zoom, phone, whatever. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Maybe can I pray before we all go? I didn't, don't think I prayed yes. in the beginning. Let's pray. <laughs> God, I thank you for this gathering. Uh, I hope that uh, in us, your Holy Spirit continues to move us um, to be part of our communities more fully, uh, to welcome the stranger, to listen deeply to our siblings around us and to help us find uh, where you are leading us. Uh, your voice speaks loud in our ears. Help us listen, help us hear, and help us together find the love that you wish us to share. Uh, Hope might be bleak, God, but you are pushing through that and helping us breathe into this new life that we have. We thank you for your resurrection power in all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, there, thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.